morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to, I guess, this episode of Growing Groceries. We're talking all about growing tropical dragon fruit, and let me let some more people in here. Um, I just want to go over a couple things here really quickly before I introduce our speaker, who is the expert on dragon fruit, not so much me. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Like I said, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service in Hernando County. And today we have a special guest instructor, Jeff Wasluski from uh, University of Florida IFAS Extension down in Miami, Florida, where they grow all the greatest tropical fruit, including dragon fruit. So I wanted to mention to everybody that if you have any questions, that's great. Go ahead and put them in the chat box during the presentations and we'll go ahead and answer all of them all at once at the very end. Um, and plant pickup. For everybody who paid for this workshop, each one of you gets three dragon fruit plants. And we have them all potted up and we have some at our nurse or, or at our office right now so you can pick them up any day this week, let me go ahead and show the um, um, addresses here. You can pick them up today at our office that's located at 16110 Aviation Loop Drive in Brooksville, Florida. We're at the very edge of the uh, Brooksville Airport Industrial Center, right next door to the post office, if you're familiar with that. Or if you'd like, I will be at our Master Gardener Nursery this coming Saturday. And we will be there from eight in the morning until, oh, I have noon on here. We will only be there until 11 a.m. They close at 11 this time of year because it gets so hot. So come by between eight in the morning and 11 a.m. And go ahead and pick up your plants. And sorry, let me get through the technical issues here. And if you have any questions or issues, if you're having a problem picking up your plants, if you're not sure exactly where our office is located or where our nursery is located, feel free to email me. My email is right there. And it's also attached with the uh, Eventbrite when you register and signed up for this workshop. And we do a number of classes on topics like this. This is just one in a whole series of classes about growing groceries. We've also done blackberries in the past and more recently pineapples. And our goal is to help teach our local residents how to be more uh, sustainable, how to be more self-sufficient and how to improve and strengthen your own personal and family uh, food systems. So we like to have these classes where we teach you how to grow something and give you a couple starter plants to kind of get you started. So we do have more of these planned for in the future. For everybody who signed up for this workshop, when we have arrangements for the next one, I'll email everybody directly. And of course we put things on Facebook. And if you're ever interested in what kind of classes we have coming up, if you go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, that's a whole listing of all of our upcoming classes on growing edibles, on Florida-friendly landscaping, irrigation. We do classes in our office on wildlife. Uh, we have a Sea Grant agent who does um, classes on marine biology. We have a wide variety of different things that we're doing. And you can find out about all of it on HernandoExtension.com. So with that, as always, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. That's definitely the best way to get in touch with me. It's W-L-E-S-T-E-R at UFL.edu. So let me quit screen sharing there and introduce today's speaker. Jeff Wasluski is uh, with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service down in Miami, Florida, down in sunny South Florida. And Jeff was kind enough to um, agree to come on here and teach all of you about how to grow, go about growing dragon fruit. He knows a lot more about it than I do. So Jeff, let me just go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Today, we're gonna do a little bit uh, 
a general introduction to dragon fruit. It's also called pataya. And sort of in three sections, the first one is sort of the horticulture of dragon fruit. Uh, and then I have Dr. Jonathan Crane, who's a tropical fruit specialist at the Tropical Research Education Center to thank for this first portion. And then we're gonna talk about um, pathogens. And I have Dr. Romina Gaziz, whose slides I'm gonna be using for that. And then we're gonna talk about pests, which uh, we have uh, Dr. Daniel Carrillo, the tropical fruit entomologist at the Tropical Research Education Center. I'll be using his slides for that. So we have a collection of different um, information here. So first thing is UFIFAS extension. I know you're coming to me from another county and we're coming to you, I'm coming to you from down here um, in uh, Miami-Dade County and we have an extension office. UFIFAS has an extension office in all 67 counties. And we also have some research centers. So I mentioned those people, uh, Dr. Carrillo, Dr. Gaziz, and Dr. Crane, they come from the Tropical Research Education Center, uh, which is very close to my office in Homestead. And we're all down in Homestead because that's where the, um, that's where most of the commercial growing takes place. So some photo acknowledgements there. And we're gonna talk about dragon fruit. This is how you grow it. This is a commercial uh, grove. So you have it on these strong posts and you wanna keep it kind of thinned out. So acknowledgements, like I said, Dr. Romina Gaziz, plant pathologist, Dr. Daniel Carrillo, uh, Dr. Hong, and Ian McGuire, some of the pictures come from him and Dr. Crane. So the pataya, dragon fruit, it is a cactus. So remember to treat it like a cactus. It's uh, triangular, sometimes four to five sided. Uh, stem segments may have three flat wavy wings. We'll see some pictures. The vines have aerial roots, which are here to the surface of which they grow. So here we have a grower that was doing something sort of interesting where they fuse together some rebar uh, and they're growing it on that rather than the, um, the four by fours. And the flowering is induced by longer days and shorter nights. So flowers are bisexual. They're very large, very fragrant. They're nocturnal. Uh, the pulp can be white, yellow, or red. I think you guys are getting yellow dragon fruit plants given to you. Um, 12 to 32 ounces, so they can get pretty big. The, uh, here's a, a picture of a vine, pretty tall one, that's uh, got the flowers sort of wilted after the night where they opened up in the night. You can imagine that's quite a sight to have all these huge flowers opened up at night. Uh, and they open in the night and then early morning as well. So here's what the stem looks like. And there's a flower there. There's an immature fruit, see very spiny. Uh, there's the mature fruit, which can still have some spines. So here's the flower to young fruit. So natural pollinators include moss and bats. So we think that's a pollinator, but there's also a little tiny uh, beetle that we'll look at at the end that could be a pollinator. Hand pollination is feasible, very labor intensive. Uh, time from development from a bud to open flowers, about 30 days. From flowering to harvest, 25 to 40 days. When the peel turns red, usually the fruit is ready to pick about a week later. So propagation, a lot of information here, but basically, if you're going to propagate, and I know that yours weren't propagated this way, but if you're going to try to propagate, the plants that you're gonna get, you're gonna wanna do it by cuttings. So you take a cutting, you kind of let it cure for about a week or less, uh, and then you put it in some really well-draining soil. So you don't usually do it by seed, you do do it by cuttings, you don't usually do it by grafting, 
uh, and you put it into, like I said, some really good, well-draining soil. And three to four-year-old vines may produce 200 pounds of fruit. That's if you're, you're doing it well. So here are some cuttings. You see a lot of perlite in the mix there. So we have good drainage, which is super important. So trellises, you're gonna wanna build something for your dragon fruit. You can do four by fours with um, two by fours on the top, like we have here at the bottom. Uh, you can do like a cement pole and you can do something like this with rebar at the top, but you're gonna need something sturdy because they can get very heavy. Uh, they can weigh several hundred pounds. So you're gonna need something sturdy. If you have an old stump of a tree, you could probably grow it on that. So you don't want your plants to be very dense because then you get a lot of uh, fungal infections and, and disease and it's harder for them to flower, harder to harvest. Um, and then you get more pests as well. So you can get in there and thin them out. You can get in there and, and thin them out. Now, when you make a cut, you wanna clean your tool in between each cut because you can do that with alcohol because you can definitely spread disease by making cuts. So you're gonna train the vine up the pole. You can tie it on there, tie it on loosely with like some tree tape. Um, you wanna to try to get one per pole, but you can do more than one, I've seen that. And so that's the horticulture of the dragon fruit. So um, think about any questions you might have in that section. Now we're gonna go into major diseases. Misinformation all comes from Dr. Gaziz, Dr. Romina Gaziz. So here are all the dragon fruit pathogens worldwide. And the ones in green are the ones we have in South Florida. So this stem and disease is very common, especially during the rainy season. Oops, sorry. Uh, symptoms are not unique. Multiple infections from different pathogens, mostly fungal, these stem diseases. Um, and you see how they can look. And lesions create entrance for secondary pathogens, usually soft rot bacteria. So dragon fruit do have a lot of pathogens. It is a big problem. We don't have a lot of things you can spray. There's not a lot of things labeled for, for dragon fruit. So anthracnose starts, you see these small little chlorotic spots like down here. Oh, sorry skipping around. When the lesion is mature, it gets a little bigger. Yellow halo can appear. Uh, it can be secondary invader as well. So this is anthracnose. So keeping the vines sort of open and more air getting in will help with this. If you're going to irrigate, don't irrigate onto the plant, irrigate the roots. Uh, alternaria. This can also cause lesions. You see these little red spots, round to reddish orange lesions with dark red centers. They have no halo. Lesions can coalesce and form larger disease area. So you see it can also get on the fruit. Fruit rot by Polaris. See this fruit rot right here. And again, um, not much you can do is spray wise. You can do some cover sprays that will protect the, the plant ahead of time. But again, there's not a lot of things that are labeled for, for Pattaya that are legal to spray. Um, Bipolaris can affect the flower buds and cause lesions on the fruit. Now fruit and stem canker, this is the most damaging. You can scan that QR code that Romina put in there that will get you to an EDIS document on stem canker. And you see, can get pretty bad. You see some of these lesions here, can get, put holes. 
and eventually the lesions dry out, the affected tissue falls off the stem, leaving the shock hole symptoms. So you see it really beats up the stem, can get really ugly. See these pictures here. And then bacteria can get in there once the disease, once the stem rot canker opens it up. Uh, it moves from the stems into the fruit. And you're going to need to address it before the bloom because it will affect your, your fruiting pretty badly. Now, some other ones that are not diseases, but you might see sunburn. If you're growing, if let's say now the plants are growing in some pretty heavy shade, and then you plant it out in full sun, you're going to get the sunburning like this. So it looks like it's yellow, and you'll see it on sort of the tops, but not the bottoms. Um, and it can hurt young plants pretty badly. So be careful. Make sure you find out how these plants are growing. If they've been growing in shade, then you want to put them in sort of medium sun and then full sun if you're going to grow it in full sun. Fertilizer and herbicide burn, and, and let's not forget weed whackers. So here's fertilizer all up against the, the, the um, trunk here. So that's really too much fertilizer, too close. So we're getting a burn. Uh, herbicide burn, and then also this looks like could be weed whacker. So this is, is bad damage, but not a pathogen. And then you can get fruit splitting. You see this in mangoes as well. Like that's happening right now in my grove with Namdak Mai mangoes. It happens with Valencia Pride mangoes. But basically, if it's pretty dry and then all of a sudden there's a big water event, the fruit can split. So you want to keep sort of steady irrigation when it's fruiting. Okay, now our last section, we're going into the pests. And we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions, if you have questions. So this comes from Dr. Daniel Carrillo. He's the tropical fruit entomologist. And he and I also always recommend uh, monitoring or scouting. In a grove, you're gonna scout these different ways. You can do the X, you can do the Z, you can do the W. Um, but if you're just growing this in your own home, then definitely you know, get out there a couple times a week, take your coffee out, take a look at your plants, inspect them, look for these pests, because if you see pests or pathogens early, you have a much better chance of taking care of them. So some of the pest thrips, you see the fruit in the bottom right. It's all scaly like that. This is thrip damage where the thrips actually feed when the fruit is much younger. And then as the fruit gets older, you have this uh, scaly, scaly damage on the fruit. So um, they're chili thrips. They're rasping, sucking insects. They attack the closed and open flowers and they pupate in the soil. So to manage, you're gonna protect the flowers. Pirate bugs are a biological control and predatory mites. Um, cultural control, weeds. Try not to have a lot of weeds around your dragon fruit because the thrips will live on the weeds and then they'll move to the dragon fruit. Don't give your plant too much nitrogen. It's a lot of insect pests like plants that are full of nitrogen. Uh, don't give it too much irrigation. They like these plants that are very green and growing a lot. And chemical control. We have one spinatorum. I, it says pending registration. I think that might have just been registered, but we can look that up. Uh, then uh, azradictin is another one that you can use for thrips. Leaf-footed bugs, you see the picture there, and they, they put these little holes into the fruit. Uh, they're sap sucking. They put their eggs on weeds. So again, control the weeds. <clears throat> Look for them. Cultural control the weeds. You can just get out there and 
crush them. Uh, chemical control, KLM may work and you may be able to do some sort of repellent. Aphids, you see the flower there is full of aphids, several different species. They're sap sucking, they form colonies, they produce honeydew and induce sooty mold. So anytime you're gonna get a lot of aphids or scale, you're also gonna get sooty mold, which can be a problem. So management, look for them on the flowers. Biological control can be parasitoids and predators. Manage the ants because ants are gonna move the aphids from one spot to another. So if you see a lot of ants around your dragon fruit, try to get rid of those ants. And again, not too much nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, mealybugs, several species, sap sucking. Adults protect the young, they get on top of them. They produce honeydew and induce the sooty mold as well. And there you can see at this bottom one some sooty mold on some of the parts of the dragon fruit there. So, management you can do pruning, kind of prune them out. And that works with, with all the different insects. Uh, biological control. Again, manage the ants, and again, cultural control, don't use too much nitrogen. Army worms, you have the beet army worm, it's, uh, it'll chew inside, uh, you can, it will damage the flowers. Uh, you can use dipel, which is always good for caterpillars, really no toxicity. Uh, pheromones, be careful if you're near vegetable fields or if you're growing vegetables because they can come from there. Uh, and control the pigweed if you're growing this, this weed down here at the bottom, if you see that weed, get rid of that because that's another host. Uh, scales, <clears throat> there's one called cactus scale, scale, sap sucking, covers the stems. You see a good picture of it there at the bottom. Uh, trunk stems. Um, again, sanitation is the key, uh, keeping your trees or your vines clear and pruned out is very important. Remember to clean your tools in between each pruning. Um, and then don't just drop the, the, what you prune onto the ground. Get rid of that, bag that up, double bag it, get rid of it, or um, compost it. And then again, be careful with too much nitrogen. So I keep saying too much nitrogen. So you wanna use something like an 839. You don't wanna use something um, with a first number, which is the nitrogen is much higher than that. Um, and I'm not sure, I know right now we have a fertilizer ordinance in effect where we're not allowed to use nitrogen or phosphorus until October 31st. So you want to check your local rules and see if that's something that is true for you. If so, if you can't use nitrogen and phosphorus, just something with potassium will help because that's the one that does flowering and fruiting. That's the last number. So if you get something like a 0022, that can help out. Pollination, we talked about bats and moths. We're not sure, but we do see these little uh, sap beetles, these tiny little guys always up in the flowers and we think they may play a part in pollination. Okay, um, so now we're gonna take questions. And before we do that, I just wanna mention my Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, which we have once a month, it's a webinar. Uh, I have about 19 of them already on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search Tropical Fruit Tuesday, uh, you're going to find all of them. And there's ones on things like jackfruit, mango. We're going to do jackfruit June 28th. We're going to do mango July 12th. Uh, there's one on carambola. There's one on planting. There's one on pruning. There's one on IPM. So lots of different ones for you there. We can also do them live. So if you want to join my email list, just um, shoot an email to me here. SFL Hort, like South Florida Horticulture, SFLHORT at ufl.edu. Or you can ask um, our gracious host that he can give you 
my email as well. So I'm going to stop sharing if I can. So we can take a peek. And thank you, Bill. Put the link there. Oh, um, you're very welcome. Yeah, I put the link to your uh, YouTube channel on there. Uh, Jen is asking in a direct message, are there any companion plants that can help to keep pests away or a specific spray for fungus? I came in a bit late. Uh, Jen, we do have a list of everything that's labeled for, um, for um, uh, dragon fruit. So I can send that to Bill and then he can send that out to the list. So let me make a list or a little note to myself. Sure. If you send that to me, everybody on here register through Eventbrite so I can send it directly out to everybody. Yeah, that would be great. And then as far as companion plants, I think it would kind of be the opposite where you're you're getting rid of any kind of weeds that are around there, anything that can uh, hold these thrips or any of the other insects. Um, but something to ward away the, the bugs, I don't think I know of anything like that. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm looking for them. Now's your time to ask. <laughs> and, and I noticed all of the different um, insect pests that cause problems with pitaya are very, very common here in Central Florida. Uh, Aphids, mealybugs, thrips, all of them are here also. So it's not like um, uh, an insect pest that's unique to South Florida. Okay, uh, Wendy asks, what causes blossoms to drop? Um, that's usually when they don't get pollinated, they're gonna drop. So hopefully you're gonna get some pollination. You can try to do hand pollination with only one plant. I think that would be possible. Uh, there's some good videos on how to do that if you go to YouTube. Um, <clears throat> and Maria asks, how long will it take for the dragon fruit plants we're getting to produce fruit? I would say maybe a year and a half as soon as they get big enough. Uh, so I think Arlen's kind of asking the same question, how fast to mature. So I would say um, year and a half. Now, something everybody needs to keep in mind is you're in South Florida and we're in Central Florida. It gets cold here in the winter. Ah. So at what point is dragon fruit uh, damaged by the cold? Approximately what temperature? Uh, we don't have a lot of data on that because we haven't had a true true freeze since they really started growing dragon fruit here. So we're not sure. There are some things you can do though to protect uh, your plant. And one of them is sort of a wrap that you can put around. There's mm -hmm. three things. One is a wrap that you can put, and you might wanna try the second thing with the wrap. Uh, and you can wrap like um, insulation and then just kind of tie it in there with some zip ties or, or something string. Uh, the other thing is you can soak the, the ground around the plant really well. Um, and you, do, you can't do that the day the freeze is coming. You have to do that sort of the day before. And that extra water will soak up the heat and keep it a little bit, a couple degrees warmer. So those are two. Uh, if you're not able to do those, uh, one thing that we do here for cold protection, and I know they do it with citrus as well, is you turn on your irrigation onto the stem right before you monitor the temperature. And as it's getting close to freezing, you turn on the irrigation and you hit the stem with that. Now the water is going to be uh, a little warmer, but what really protects it is as that water turns from liquid to ice, it releases just a little bit of energy and that insulates the, um, the trunk. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, another thing you might wanna do for dragon fruit is just take some cuttings. Take some cuttings and bring them inside because they're gonna grow again from cuttings. 
So that's something you can do. Um, <clears throat> Sonia asked, should we plant them in partial shade? No, I think full sun is the best way to go. But again, if they're being grown in heavy shade now, don't put them straight into full sun. Then put them in, just kind of keep them in pots in some partial shade and then move them to full sun. Uh, Wendy says hers died back when we went below freezing. Yeah, I would, you know, I would say freezing or below is, is going to do some damage, but you can try those techniques I told you. Uh, Sonia asked, should we water them daily? No, remember they're a cactus. So this time of year when we're getting here, we're getting some rains, I think you don't really need to water them that much. But then as we get into drier times, maybe once, um, once or twice a week at most, and maybe half inch of water. Yes, right now the plants are in little three inch pots. So yeah. in those pots, they dry out pretty quickly. But once you get them transplanted into your yard and into the garden, uh, especially since we're right on the edge of getting into regular rainy season. Yes. You know, uh, regular and, rainfall, when we're getting plenty during the summer, should be fine, right? Yes, for sure. It is a cactus, so you don't want to overwater. And remember, water the roots, don't water the plant. Um, Frank asks, are you going to discuss specifics regarding pollination or pruning methods? So pollination, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with hand pollination, um, but the less you spray to try to get rid of other insects, the more chance you have of pollinators getting in there. Um, and there are some cultivars where the male and female parts are kind of far apart, so they don't poll self-pollinate well. Uh, hopefully the one you have is, is going to be a little better. Um, pruning, like I mentioned, pruning, you want to just thin it out so you take out the old, um, you leave the newer growth, you take out the older growth, and every time you make a cut, clean your tools, and then get rid of that. Don't just drop it down below uh, your, your, your plant because the disease can can hop up there from the ground to your plant. Um, Stacy asked, can they stand the full sun here? Uh, same question as before. So yeah, I think they can take full sun. And would they be happy in really large pots? I sometimes they do grow them that well that way here. Remember, they are going to get big eventually. So if it's in a pot, that pot is going to have to be anchored really well with whatever it's growing on. So it could be in a pot if that's just the soil you're going to use. Uh, you can use some good well-draining soil, but whatever is in the center of that pot, it can't just be a, a four by four stuck in the pot. It has to be anchored to the ground. Uh, Teresa asks, do you recommend any particular frame structure over another for using metal rebar conduct too much heat. I think you're fine with rebar, um, but you can't just put like one rebar. You're gonna have to do what the grower did where they sort of soldered them together to make a, a stronger, um, bigger area to grow. I would, if it were just me building it, I might go with, instead of a four by four, I might go with like a, a four by six, something pretty, heavy and then when you put it in the ground um put those they have those little metal casings that you can put around the the bottom that help with rot because even though the wood's pressure treated it is probably still going to rot and eventually fall over um so i would go with the biggest kind of wood you can use um and then on the top put i would go four by fours instead of two by fours you want to build it as strong as you can because you don't want it just falling over eventually. Okay, that's the last question I see. Okay, any other last minute questions? Go ahead and get them in now. Um, I had a question for you about the different diseases. Are there any fungicides that are currently labeled for use on Pattaya or they're still in the process of getting them registered? Uh, there are. 
I don't know them off the top of my head, but they'll be on that list that I'm able to to send you. Okay. But they're not they're not great. I remember anytime you use something, you want to rotate. You don't want to use the same thing over and over again because mm -hmm. um, insects and disease will kind of get uh, resistant to it. So always rotate. And we don't have a lot to rotate, unfortunately. So really your best thing to do is keep it open, keep it airflow. Uh, don't water the, the stems, water the ground. Um, that's your, your best chance. Uh, Wendy asked, so if it's put in ground, are they good with sandy dirt? Uh, and how often to fertilize and what kind? So sandy dirt, hopefully that's sort of well-draining. You want something sort of well-draining. Um, how often to fertilize? I would fertilize two to three times in the growing season if you're allowed. I don't know your rules. We're not allowed to do that. And I would go with an 839, which is a typical fruit tree special. Uh, Stacy asked, do they transplant well if we need to keep them in pots for a little while? Uh, they do, they do. And you can, if, if they, um, he said that um, they're sort of drying, the pots are drying out quickly now. So what you could do is step them up to a bigger pot and then that would help out a lot. Um, and something else I might add, um, right now the plants are small and they're in three inch pots. You probably don't want to put them outside in the full sun on a very, very sunny day. Uh, we got a little bit of sunburn on a few of the branches on them after we started repotting them up. So you want to put them outside in a partly sunny spot for right now and kind of build them up to full sun before you transplant them into the ground. So possibly going from the little three inch pots they're in today to a larger pot and then into the ground wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, so the next question is, would it be better to start off with a cutting? I would just keep stepping up the pot uh, and not make a cutting. Um, there's a question for you, which I'll save for us in a second. Okay. There, uh, Nami asks, I have a plant growing in Central Florida, looks healthy hasn't produced any fruit in three years. Any suggestions on how to promote fruit growth? Um, I always say that if you're having trouble with, with flowering and fruiting, try more potassium. That's that last number in the fertilizer, the 839. So instead of an 839, the nine would be the potassium. I would use like a 0022 to try to help it with flowering and fruiting. Uh, Stacy asked, when can you start propagating? Um, I would wait till, till they're at least uh, a foot or longer. Um, and then you can take, I would, if I'm going to take a piece to propagate, I would take it about 10 inches. So, so wait till it gets, wait till it starts putting out multiple stems before you propagate. Uh, and Jen asks, does it have to meet a size requirement before it produces fruit, or does it just have to be a certain age? I think it's really both. I think if it stays really small and skinny, it's not going to feel like it can flower and fruit. And then it also needs a certain age. And I think that would be true for most tropical fruit. Uh, and then question for you, when can we pick up the plants from the university? I'm in the Tampa area. You can pick them up from our office here in Brooksville in Hernando County, whenever you want. We have them here today. And we are open from eight in the morning till five in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. Even if I'm not here, everybody else knows where the plants are. They have the list to go ahead and check off your name. So feel free to stop by whenever you'd like. For people who aren't able to make it to our office, we will be in our Master Gardener Nursery and I'll be sure to, um, email out that address. I think it probably was in some of the emails that are sent out already. So I'll, I will be there this coming Saturday to hand out the remainders. And if you have any other problems with being out of town or not having anybody to pick them up, just shoot me an email and we'll work something out. But you could stop by the office today if you'd like. And Nami asks, how old are the cuttings we're receiving? Does that age count towards the one and a half years 
towards maturing. The age does count. And how old are they? A couple months? It's just a couple months. They started them from clean tissue culture. Yeah. So these were not started from older cuttings. They were started from tissue culture. So the, you figure they're all basically maybe two, three months old at this point. Okay. So maybe you get it before the year and a half. Maybe you can get it within a year. I know it's very important to take good care of them and get them to grow big and healthy that when the way when they do get to the age where they can flower, ideally you're going to get a number of flowers and fruits off of them. Frank, I don't know what to tell you. He says our plant produces many flowers and we hand pollinate according to the videos without any success, any suggestions. I don't have experience with hand pollination. So one thing you might want to try that might help is when you get the second plant, uh, try some cross pollination. I think that could be something that can help. And maybe buy a third, third different cultivar and try some cross pollinate. That may help. Uh, yeah, I've, I've hand pollinated squash plants before with Q-tips and it works really well. Okay, and Wendy says she started some from seed six months ago. From seed, they might take longer to, um, to give fruit. Uh, Sonia says, do those two plants need to be planted nearby? Uh, I would try to plant them close together, but um, I think Frank is gonna try hand pollination, so they don't really need to be close together. But if you're gonna try to get pollinators to help you out, I think, yeah, close by would be good, but within the same yard should be close enough. So do we have any other questions? You guys are all welcome. I see you saying thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. Hope to see you at Tropical Fruit Tuesdays at 2. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for uh, being willing to do this and sure. uh, coming on here My after pleasure. a nice long holiday weekend. <laughs> and for everybody else, we'll be I'll be sending out the link to this video in just a little bit. And if you have any other questions, either get a hold of myself or Jeff, you know, here at Extension, we're here to help you out and answer your questions. And if I don't have the answer, I'll find somebody who does have the answer. That's so let me do. go ahead and stop the recording. Hi guys.